your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Matthew again at chapter number 5. Continuing in our series, The Great Reversal. Verse number 4 of the Beatitudes. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Thank you. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. While the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. While this first beatitude has to do with what we are in our spirits, when the Holy Spirit begins his perfect work of leaving us stripped and humbled in the presence of God. The second beatitude has to do with what we are in our souls when our spiritual nakedness and bankruptcy has been revealed. When our spiritual nakedness and bankruptcy are revealed, we are plunged into sorrow for our sin. Verse 4 is the second stage of spiritual blessing. It is one thing to be spiritually poor and acknowledge it, while it is another to grieve and mourn over it. Or for the theologians in our midst this morning, it's one thing to confess, it's quite another to be contrite. Because you do know you can have confession without contrition. Wish I had a witness here. I fear that we Christians, by making much of grace, sometimes thereby make light of sin. There's not enough sorrow for the sin that is among us. We ought to weep as a people for what President Obama has just decreed. This, this, this idea of this transgender mess of these boys going in the girls' restroom and girls going in the boys, we ought to weep over that. That's sinful. That's disgraceful. With all the problems we have in this country, with all of the mess that's going on in the world, I don't have time to be talking about no bathrooms and, and transgenders and homosexuals. His legacy is homosexuality. When what we ought to be concerned about as a nation is the sorrow that we ought to plunge into because of our sins. Um, when I was a church musician back in the Stone Ages, uh, we used to sing a song, Oh, for a closer walk with God, a calm and heavenly frame, a light to shine upon the road that leads unto the Lamb. Where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where is the soul-refreshing view of Jesus and his word? Return, O holy dove, return, sweet messenger of rest. I hate the sin that made thee mourn and drove thee from my breast. There's not enough mourning over sin. There's not enough sadness over sin. We are large on the grace of God, 
but then there's lightness and a frivolity over sin. Have you ever noticed something in the scripture? In the scripture, when you read the Bible, you never read one time in the scripture where Jesus laughed. Read it when you get home. He, he might have, but there's not one instance in the scripture where Jesus ever laughed. He got angry. He slept. He ate. He cried. He tore tables up and ran money changes up. But there's not one place in the Bible where Jesus is ever mentioned laughing. Isaiah says he's a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. He, he wept over the tomb of Lazarus. He sweat drops of tear, uh, tear uh, uh, blood in the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus never laughs because sin is not a laughing matter. Licentiousness, debauchery, none of the things that look like that displeases God made Jesus ever laugh. There's this silly religion that I saw some time ago on television where uh, the, the, the whole church service is about them laughing. Uh, and the scripture does say that laughter is good medicine. But, but I don't laugh over sin. Uh, the, the stuff that's going on in this country, in this city, in this nation, in my family, in your family, is not stuff that we ought to be laughing about. Because you can tell much about a person by what he or she cries over. I wish I had somebody to help me preach it. When was the last time you cried over your sin? You mourned over how you displeased God. I wish I had one or two more witnesses here. Because when you mourn over your sins, it does something to your praise. It does something to your hallelujah. It does something to your worship because you realize how low down you are, but how righteous God is. Well, well let me see if I can help you from the scripture. It was in the year that King Uzziah died. I wish I had a Bible reading. I saw also the Lord high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. Seraphim had six wings. The doorpost moved. The house was filled with smoke. And I saw all of that beatific vision and I said, whoa, is me? For I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I wish I had a Bible reader. And then one of the seraphim went to the altar with some live coal and, and took it off the altar and pressed it to my lips. And he said, your sins are forgiven and your iniquity is purged. Then I heard the voice of God saying, whom shall I sin? And who will go for us? After God purged me, then said I, here am I send me. You are not ready to really worship until you see yourself as you really are. And the reason worship doesn't mean much to many of us in here this morning is because you think you're pretty good already. That's because you're measuring yourself by the wrong yardstick. You want to see how good you really are? Stand up next to Jesus. And like Isaiah, you got to say, whoa! Oh. All of the Beatitudes. If I was a if I was a more inexperienced preacher, I'd start hollering right here. Uh, but uh I've been at this almost 40 years. 
So let me slow my roll right here. Because when I think about how good God is, and how no good I am, when I think about he didn't have to wake me up this morning, he didn't have to put food on my table. He didn't have to make a way out of no way. He just chose out of his sovereign goodness to give me another opportunity to come up to his house. Not because I've been so holy. Not because I've kept his commandments. Because I did enough yesterday that I ought to be dead and in my grave. Uh. All of the beatitudes, all of the beatitudes are paradoxical because what they promise for what they demand seems incongruous. What they promise for what they demand seems incongruous and upside down in the eyes of the world. What could be more contradictory than the idea that the sad are happy? That the path to blessedness is sadness. That the way to rejoicing is mourning. Now, brothers and sisters, hear me. There is an improper way to mourn. There is an improper way to mourn. When you read the scriptures, David's two children, Amnon and Tamar. Uh, Tamar was a beautiful daughter of King David. And her brother Amnon wanted to have her sexually. And the scripture said he grieved over the fact that he could not sexually make advances on his own sister. And it got the better of him until one day he raped his own sister. That's improper mourning. And then there is, the, there is the improper mourning that comes with carrying legitimate sorrow to illegitimate extremes. Uh, kind of like we do in our culture. Uh, keep people two weeks. Uh, waiting for the funeral to be on Saturday. Somebody dies on Sunday and you can't bear him Wednesday because uh, we think you're getting rid of them too soon. What, what are you supposed to do with a dead person? Come on, talk back to me if you can. We, we think it's a disgrace if you don't go a week and a half before you bury somebody because you got to go to your job and, and see your grandmother died again. That's why you can't take off on Tuesday or, or Thursday for the funeral because you've been taking off saying my grandmother died. How many grandmothers do you have on your first cousin's side? Talk back to me if you can. We hold, we hold that too long. Let me give you a little formula that hopefully you'll, you'll take advantage of it next time there's a death in your family. Grief is to be expected. It's to be experienced, but it's not to be extended. Let me see if I can help you from the scripture. David had a child with Bathsheba. I wish I had a Bible reading. And because of his sin with Bathsheba, the child died. And David could not be consoled. While the child was sick, he wouldn't bathe, he wouldn't shave, he wouldn't eat, and the servants thought that David was going to lose his mind. But the minute the child died, David got up, took a bath, shaved, put some clothes on, sat down at the table and ate, and his servant says, Master, just a few hours ago, we thought you, we, we were going to lose you, and now here you are sitting at the table. David said, he can't come where I am but I can go where he is. Somebody ought to help me preach it. It's sinful to mourn 10 years over something that the Lord took from you. The Lord gave 
and the Lord has taken away blessed be the name of the Lord now that does not mean that you're not sorry does not mean that you don't shed tears does not mean that you will not miss the person you just don't put the person before God's grace yeah, that's improper mourning then there is proper mourning Robert Browning Hamilton expresses the truth of this second beatitude in a familiar poem of his. He says, I walked a mile with pleasure. She chattered all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a while with sorrow and ne'er a word said she, but all the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. In this second beatitude, Jesus is speaking of godly sorrow, godly mourning, mourning that only those who sincerely desire to belong to him can experience. The only sorrow that brings spiritual life and growth is godly sorrow over sin that leads to repentance. Again, you can have confession without contrition. And God says, uh, David says, a contrite heart God will not despise. The word carries the idea, this word mourning in the text carries the idea of deep inner agony. But blessedness does not come in the morning itself. Because you can mourn and still not be blessed. The morning comes, the, the, the morning comes, and we mourn over our sins, but the blessing is not in the morning. But with what God does in response to our mourning. God responds to our mourning over sin with forgiveness and spiritual healing. Uh, godly mourning brings godly blessedness. I said godly mourning brings godly blessedness. A blessedness which no amount of human effort or optimistic pretense no amount of positive or possibility thinking can ever produce the kind of blessedness that comes from God. Uh, the mark of the mature Christian is not sinlessness, which is reserved for heaven, but a growing awareness of sinfulness. Not sinlessness, but a growing awareness of sinfulness. Uh, as a Christian, I'm still sinful because I still tabernacle in this flesh. I still live in this tenement of clay. And as long as I am in this body, I wrestle with my sin nature. I I'm talking about me. I'm not talking about you. You got it all together. You don't sin. You don't lust. You don't, you don't deal with pride. You don't have any problems, no issues with jealousy. You ain't got no situations like that. So I'm not talking to you. You go right back to sleep. But to those of us here who wrestle with the stuff I just got through talking about, no amount of possibility thinking can remove that from our presence. But when we know Jesus Christ, we are not sinless. We just try to sin less. Did you get that? We are not sinless. Our goal is to sin less. Just, just keep on living and after a while it ain't gonna matter I wish I had somebody to help me right here 
Just, just keep on praying for him, sister. He coming back home. Care how cute he think he is? I don't care how fine she thinks she is. Just keep on living and it won't even matter. I wish I had time to stay right there. Uh, the great. <laughs> I, I, I know where y'all trying to get me to go, but I, I ain't gonna do it, I ain't gonna do it. I wanna do it so bad, I don't know what to do. <laughs> But I'm gonna leave it alone. I'm, I'm gonna go on. The great, <laughs> the great Protestant reformer. Come on, get your mind back in church. The great Protestant reformer, Martin Luther, in his 95 theses tacked on the door of the church at Wittenberg, Germany, said that the entire Christian life is a continuous act of repentance and contrition. Uh, repentance and contrition. God, I messed up. And I'm mourning over that. Whenever you are proud of sin, it may be that you don't even know God. Because sin can't make the child of God proud. I, I don't, li, li, listen, let me, thank you, Holy Ghost. H here's my problem with this homosexual agenda, which is sin according to the scripture that my president is trying to promote. All of us here this morning who are Christians who sin, try to make sure that it's never exposed. But homosexuality is in your face. Bragging on the fact that I'm transgender or I'm a transvestite or I'm gay or lesbian. Bragging on the fact that you are displeasing God. And, and you mark my words. They are not satisfied with just being married by judge or justice of the peace. They want to be married in a church before a preacher and a congregation to legitimize their sinful lifestyle. Talk back to me if you can. But I, for one, if it empties this church, I will never back up on what I know the scripture says is the right thing to do. Have I got a witness here? Now, if a man sins with a woman, it's still a sin, but at least you're aiming at the right target. It's still missing the mark. It's still a transgression. It's still an iniquity in the sight of God, but homosexuality is an abomination. I didn't, I, I didn't mean to go over there. I really was trying not to get over there. But, but the president got my pressure all up. And I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to stay in the text, children. Let me get back to what I'm talking about. This sermon this morning has only one point. I know, I know you're accustomed to introduction and, and three points and a poem at the end. Uh, but I, this, this sermon this morning and the one in the next worship has only one point. Let me see if I can help us with this one point and I'm going to leave you alone. Ernest Hemingway, um, who was a prolific author and writer, who knew the power of words. Ernest Hemingway made a bet with a group of authors 
over lunch. And this bet that Ernest Hemingway made with these authors over lunch has become an anecdote about his life. They bet Ernest Hemingway $10 that he could not write a short story in six words. They bet Ernest Hemingway $10 that he could not write a short story in six words. And Hemingway took the bet because he was a genius when it came to making words count. He took the bet and he took a napkin and scribbled these six words on the napkin that are a powerful story. Here's the six words that Ernest Hemingway wrote a short story in six words. The words are for sale. Baby shoes never worn. For sale. Baby shoes never worn. That's a powerful, powerful story. Everybody in here this morning got a six word story. And, and, and this little sermon, the, 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 the only point of this sermon is six words. Hemingway said, for sale, baby shoes never worn. That's a six word short story. Here's another story that somebody might have in this church sitting in the pew with you this morning. There has been a terrible accident. Six words. Here's my six word story. I'm leaving. The marriage is over. Here's somebody else's story. Your position is no longer needed. Here's somebody else's story. I just want to be friends. Here's somebody else's story. The cancer isn't responding to treatment. Six words. Here's somebody else's story. You are not able to conceive. That's somebody else's story. Here's the last story. Here's a rose off the casket. Six words. Did I say it was over? No, it's not. Because God has six words. That's the point of this whole sermon. You ready? God will not waste your pain. God will not waste your pain. Blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. God will not waste your pain. Cry in the midnight but weeping will endure for a night but joy will come in the morning. Let them fire you on your job. No weapon sown against me will be able to prosper. Let your enemies think they have the upper hand. Greater is he that is in me 
than he that is in the world. I'm trying to close here now. But God will not waste your pain. Go through whatever you got to go through. Cry as long as you think you need to cry. But then pick yourself up. Take a bath. Put some clothes on. Come back to church on Sunday morning. And said, I thought I'd never stop crying. But the Lord dried my tears. I thought I'd never laugh again. But here I am in the house of God. Testifying that if you trust and never doubt. He will surely bring you out. Somebody got a story that I just mentioned a moment ago. You don't know who you're sitting next to on the pew this morning. You don't know what their story. You don't know what their pain. You don't know why they shout so much. You don't know why they praise God with such enthusiasm. Because God has brought them through so much. God has brought them over so much. God has brought them around so much. And you trying to figure out why they're still smiling with all the stuff they've been going through. God will not waste your pain. You ought to encourage somebody this morning who's gone through the valley and the shadow of death. Somebody who's got some trial in their life today. You don't know who God sent next to sit by you today. They might just need to hear you encourage them. Why don't you grab your neighbor by the hand and come on, testify to them today. Tell them for me, God will not waste your pain. Come on, reach behind you and encourage somebody else. God will not waste your pain. Is there anybody here can help me say it one more time? God will not waste your pain. He will make a way out of no way. He will pick you up and turn you around. He will let the sun shine in your life again. He will make a way out of no way. He will give you back what the devil stole from you. He will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. He will, yes he will. Is there anybody here got your own story to tell? I need you to do one more thing for me. Grab somebody by the hand. Tell them you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I cried over. You don't know what I've been suffering over. But the Lord brought me through. The Lord brought me out. You see my glory. But you don't know my story. Is there anybody here can help me say blessed assurance? Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I'm an heir of salvation purchased by God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. I wonder, do you have a story today? Shake somebody's hand. Tell them this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Do you have a story? I said, do you have a story? God will not waste your pain. God will not waste your pain. He's going to turn it around. He's going to fix it for you. He's going to comfort you. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? 
if you know he will and you're not ashamed to testify why don't you hug somebody tell them can't nobody do me like Jesus can't nobody can't nobody I know he's alright Everybody here Everybody here has a six-word story. But thank God, that's just one chapter. God has not written the end of the book. Because when you look in the back of the book, there are some answers in the back of the book. Somebody ought to help me close here. When I was in 10th grade, I never could get geometry. Never could figure it out. But I had a classmate whose father was a retired math teacher. And he had the teacher's manual. And when I couldn't figure out the answer, she'd give me the teacher's manual. I had the answers in the back of the book. If you don't know how things are gonna turn out in your life, the answer is in the back of the book. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And I, John, saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven like a bride dressed up for her husband. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more sorrow or crying, no more pain or death for the former thing or passed away. Behold, we see through a glass darkly. But one day face to face, I will know even as also I am known.